How are you doing today, Bob Books here for the Gilly Goo? Almost Valentine's Day, you got things figured out. Anyway, just thought I'd check in here. We got a bit of topic we're going to talk about today. It's about wild parsnip and how it's affecting a lot of municipalities and certainly our municipality here in Mississippi Mills and, and in Lanark County and stuff where we live here in eastern Ontario. And what are some of the things you can do to help eradicate it without the use of pesticides? So what is wild parsnip? Where did it come from and why do we have it here and what are we going to have to do about it? That's the big question uh, in, in a lot of municipalities across Canada, North America for that matter. And where did it come from? Well, most uh, thought it was came from uh, the settlers as they came from Europe. They came from here, so it comes from Europe and Asia. Um, and it, it you know populates in our uh, roadside ditches and some of our agricultural fields and things and some of them are integrated in very large populations some of them are very low uh, level populations and then also well, what's the problem with it the problem with it is that it can be very the juice inside the plant can be very toxic to the skin uh, it creates a burn like thing on your skin some people just it's sort of a in like a uh, a sunburn. Other people are very, very severely burnt, and and it creates blister, large blisters and things on on their body. So, but one thing you know, kind of some of the points and stuff that have been made about it is that it, uh, if you if there's an education program and to become aware of how to deal with it and to become aware of how to control it manually without the use of pesticides that perhaps that's the best use of our of our resources um, you know there is, there is some recommendations set forward uh, by the uh, the count the Ontario Invasive Plant Council they give us some very uh, broad guidelines on how we can uh, best control it I really think one of the major points is that we have to raise the awareness of the public and we have to educate uh, the public that for everybody to be able to do their part on on being able to remove small patch areas of this product plant uh, excuse me without the use of pesticides because when we get to talk about pesticides and herbicides uh, particular the herbicides in this particular case when we get to, to that point to talk about that that's our main go-to thing and we got to understand that there's a, there's some some change that's going to be required here because we're dealing with a lot of problems as a result of herbicide and pesticide overuse uh, and the killing of our pollinators killing of the broadleaf plants uh, that the pollinators use all those things is creating a serious serious problem uh, so that's one point is that the proposed solution is creating more of a problem than what we're trying to eradicate and in, in, in this case the wild parsnip so we really have to take a look at that but right off the bat the associated blog today uh, I have a guest writer that's helping me out with this blog today because it's a very contentious issue and there's a lot of uh, uh, resources that uh, needed to be looked at so I want to really thank uh, Robin Lloyd uh, she has uh, her bachelor's of science was a, a with a biology uh, influence and environmental influence that she is and she trained at Trent University and uh, she's a very knowledgeable and uh, pleasant person to, to speak with so I want to thank you very much, Robin, for your documents here. It's really appreciated, and that'll be the association blog with it, with this video. So, what is the wild parsnip? And where did it come from? So, it came from uh, Europe and Asia. Probably the settlers, settlers brought it in, and it's been spreading across Canada, North America, and the world for that matter ever since. Um, there's a very easy way to uh, eliminate uh, wild parsnip. It mostly grows in the ditches along the uh, agricultural fields or along the edge of fields and things. And it can be taken out manually without any trouble whatsoever. Uh, so I really think the awareness side and the education side of how to deal with it other than having to spray it, it is really, really the key to this. And locally, our municipal budget here locally for a spraying program that they wanted to initiate here was uh, was sneaking up close to a hundred thousand uh, dollars for the spring program uh, of which it would be non effective that's the thing so there's a bunch of points there is that it's not going to be effective it's not going to be a one-time thing uh, and then it also is killing all the other broadleaf plants that are in the vicinity of the the localized spray 
So uh, all the pollinators and butterflies and bees and hummingbirds and birds themselves and all those things that would be associated in those areas are not going to be able to use those areas either because there's be going to be a, a, a full eradication of all the plant matter in that, that area. So that's one of the big things. So we have to raise the awareness and, uh, and, and follow through with some education so that everybody understands that there's some, some other alternatives. And the Ontario Invasive Plant Council also comes up with a, a whole host of recommendations as to ways that you can eliminate this plant uh, without the necessary need for uh, for spraying of chemical of, of herbicide. And certainly, the other thing is that if there are small isolated areas that you can eradicate the plant out of those locations. The other then thing is that we talk about all the time here at the Gilly Glue is to incorporate and include native plants into that area that will suppress the growth of those other plants. And that's really a serious thing. We really need to get back into uh, creating the biodiversity of an ecology that is in native plants so that the bugs that are associated with certain plants can still continue to live which will continue with the life cycle of our ecology and so that's a major 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 point the other major point I really feel out of this paper that Robin had, had written here is that regardless of uh, how much spray is put in this year throughout our entire municipality, it's not going to eliminate the plant. It's still going to continue because of the, the seed sources and things that are, that are still available. It's only going to come back up next year. So we really have to take a serious look at other things. And then the chemical that's used is, uh, in a lot of these instances is called Clearview. Uh, it's a non-selective herbicide, so that's what that means. The chemical kills all broadleaf plants that it comes in contact with. So that includes clover, goldenrod, wild strawberry, uh, and it stays active in the soil for up to 24 months. So it is affecting our ecosystem, and it will take years for it, our ecosystem to recover from that. So that alone says that uh, we have to take a, a, a real look at some other ways of, of dealing with this problem. And the other thing that's a very key thing, and Robin brought this up to me when we were having a really good conversation yesterday, all of these invasive things, so everything in Canada was invasive at one time or another because if you look back to the, to the Ice Age, all plant matter was eliminated. So everything that is here was invasive at one point or another. And it all reaches its peak and then it all extinguishes itself over time. So we have to kind of take some common sense there as well to take a look at it this thing. You know, so we don't really know what it's going to do and we understand that and we have to have some precautionary things but the education then of individuals to know how to handle it, to know how to deal with it, to be wary of it and if you think of poison ivy for instance as an, uh, an associated thing, we all know to be aware of poison ivy and we all know that if we're going into an area that has a potential to have poison ivy in it, we become aware of where it is and become aware of what we're wearing so that we don't be, get in contact with poison ivy and this wild parsnip is no different. So we have to really try to take a look at how it is what we're going to do. So this clear view chemical that uh, is put out is also not safe for the use in and around water. Uh, so if we're thinking of our well water or our water tables uh, and or our marshes and all those other areas, it cannot be sprayed anywhere near any of those things. And the company Dow Chemicals themselves that created this chemical off has these warnings on the label of this particular uh, chemical to, as to where it can be applied. And, and, and my stance on a chemical, I mean, uh, herbicide and or pesticide is that we have to change our perspective, our perception of how and when we use chemicals of any kind. I think we've, uh, we've become hypnotized with the use of chemicals in all areas of our society today. And I'm not here to point fingers at anybody or say it's anybody's fault. I just think that we have lost our sense of creativity and how to deal with things. And, in, and even if you think about lawns, people are, have been hypnotized about dandelions, for instance, as a, as a simple example. And the number of people that I know that just go bananas over trying to remove dandelions from their lawn year after year after year after year after year, 
it, it's just amazing. So we grow a grass as an example, and I ain't gotten off topic here, but we grow a grass that's often a Kentucky bluegrass mixture of, of things, and it, it doesn't necessarily grow, grow well here in our climate. So weeds, as they're called, which is just a term, they're not weeds, they're just, it's just the way that we view these weeds, it's our perception of this particular plant. And, they start to take over on the grass. So then there's a receding process and a chemical spray to eliminate those plants so that the grass can grow. That diminishes over a couple of years and the whole process is repeated again. So we're hypnotized with the use of chemicals uh, on a regular basis in our landscaping industry, our agricultural industry. And now in, in our municipal in, uh, uh, areas to control an invasive plant. So if you think about purple loosestrife, for instance, it was going to be a major, major, major issue a few years ago, and it certainly did take a hold. But as it's seen now, it's not necessarily a problem, and its invasiveness diminished itself over time. So we have to become more educated, more aware of what the things that we need to do. We have to follow the guidelines of the Ontario Invasive Plant Council and understand when and how and where we should do what type of an eradication program to, that's going to be effective for this invasive species. Um, so because just randomly spraying anywhere at any particular time of year isn't necessarily the answer at all because if it's allowed to be gone to seed you're it it's just a, going to be a repeat process like we've talked about with the lawns and things um, so that's a major major point um, and so what becomes then the problem? Is the spraying the problem or is the invasive species the problem? And I think we get lost in that concept in that the spraying becomes a bigger problem than the actual plant or the actual thing that we're trying to deal with. So I think we have to be taking a real real good look at that. I'm super excited uh, about this blog post and how it's been able to come together with uh, Robin and helping me out writing this and, and having a great conversation about it. And uh, hope you enjoy this and certainly take a good hard look at how you use herbicides and pesticides around your house, around your kids, around your grandkids, uh, and in the agriculture industry, landscape industry, and come up with other ways that you can eliminate the pro so-called problem plant matter that's around your house. Anyway, thank you very much for stopping by and keep those feeders filled.